and I have the pleasure of introducing John Mergel. He is the Horticulture and Natural Resources Agent in Douglas County. Um, he's also wrapping up his interim county director duties. He's going to be presenting Plant Besties, Evidence for Companion Planting Success. And now John isn't sure if plants lead emotional lives, but if they do, he's pretty certain that some of them would be his friends. So John, we're excited to have you this morning or today, and I'll let you know when we have the right view. Ah, I always do this wrong. There we go. Okay. That seems right. Is that right? Yep. You're good right. to go. Fabulous. Thank you. Thanks, Darren. Um, and welcome everyone. So today we are going to talk about plant besties. Um, or evidence for companion planting success. Um, so I'm uh, John, as Darren said, down in Douglas County, uh, located on the fairgrounds here in Castle Rock. And um, we're gonna start just by talking about what is, what is companion planting and why would we care about it? And the short answer is, who knows? Because companion planting like natural food, for example, is one of those unregulated terms that is essentially meaningless um, because so many people have applied so many different meanings to it. And in fact, this has been recognized by researchers who are trying to um, investigate companion plants. So again, um, the biggest constraint upon progress in companion plant research is confusion over definitions and terminology because we just can't agree on what we're talking about when we say companion plants. But I think, um, a kernel to take out of, out of this or the basis under all of that is that plants grow in ecosystems, not in vacuums. So it makes sense that they have relationships with other organisms in the ecosystem. And if we know that system, if we're able to understand the ecology that our plants are growing in, maybe we can manipulate it and cause change. And that change might be good or bad. So that's the impetus for companion planting. So today, um, the first thing we're going to do is define our terms. Then I'm going to talk about a little bit more uh, in depth than I just did about why we would bother about companion plants. We're going to talk about how to evaluate claims of companion plant uh, pairings that you should use. Then we're going to look at some examples from the real world. That was when I got to have fun and go to the library and read companion planting books and spend a lot of time on the internet just reading. Um, and so we're going to look at those uh, real world examples and we'll, we'll run through a couple really thoroughly as practice and then we'll just quickly cover some other examples. And then finally, we'll close with some evidence supported companion planting strategies that are out there. And so uh, you look here in this, this uh, picture on this slide, you'll see um, uh, like a, a seed rack card that's hanging. You'll find these at garden centers and hardware stores this time of year and say, oh, what a helpful little resource. It's companion plants, you can see, oh look, um, some plants are helping others by enhancing their flavor or deterring pests or blah, blah, blah. And then here's how to choose compatible neighbors. And it's just a list. And that's really not how to choose compatible neighbors. That's a list of claims. Um, so we're going to talk about how to evaluate those. And I uh, just want to draw your attention quickly to the carrot section. You see that you should avoid planting dill with your carrots. And there is actually some research around this, but it's not what you might think. Um, and that uh, this study that was conducted in Poland 10 years ago now found that if you interplant dill with your carrots, you can actually reduce the numbers of carrot flies that infect carrots. So if carrot flies are a concern, interplanting with dill might actually be a great idea. The dill, however, did reduce carrot yields. And so that may be where something like this recommendation that's just a blanket statement of don't plant your dill with your carrots can come from. Um, but that's a blanket statement that shouldn't be applied in all situations. Because again, for carrot fly management, the deal was great. All right, so let's define terms. What the heck is companion planting? No cop out answer this, this time. Um, and so this is my definition. I just typed it, I made it up. I didn't even look up in a dictionary. So I'm sure that there are other definitions out there. But for the purposes of today and this talk, this is what companion planting is is the deliberate cultivation of different kinds of plants nearby to one another in order to generate health or yield benefits for the plant. For today, I'm going to exclude crop rotation in that, um, simply because there's a wide body of research about crop rotation and the benefits of crop rotation. And when most people are talking about companion plants, they're not talking about crop rotation. They're talking about planting plant X next door to plant Y in space 
and in time, not in the same place, but over a period of years as crop rotation would be. But we are going to talk today about the claims of pest suppression, of living fertilizer, of structural support, and of flavor enhancement. So why do we bother about companion plants at all? Why is this even a topic that we're interested in? Um, and I think there really, it gets down to, we want to get to this, uh, this pest management, uh, this gardening uh, Eden, right? Where we don't have to do much and everything just works out great using nature, working in harmony with nature is this idea that we all have. And it makes sense to think, all right, look, plants grow together. There's ecosystems everywhere. The plants are relating to other plants and to the wider world in a lot of ways, some of which we understand and some of which we don't understand at all or are just beginning to get glimpses of how complicated plants relationships with the world is. Um, recently, I was watching a, a television program with my kids about animals and it's about octopus um, and, and cephalopods. And my kids are infatuated with octopi, octopuses. And um, there's this line in the show that says, cephalopods are the closest thing to aliens on planet Earth. And I'd say, all right, well, they kind of look like Hollywood aliens, but I think plants are much closer to aliens because at least cephalopods are animals and I can relate to being an animal. I can't relate at all to what it's like to be a plant. So in my opinion, plants are the closest thing to aliens. There's a lot going on there that we don't understand, but we do know that positive and negative relationships exist. And it would make sense that if we can understand those relationships, we could exploit them to our own benefit and the benefit of the plant. So again, for most gardeners, we're thinking about companion planting in the context of integrated pest management or IPM. And IPM makes great use of what is called the uh, disease triangle or the pest triangle. And this is just a way to represent how it is that you could have a disease or an insect problem in a planting. And essentially, you need three things. You think of all three-legged stool or all of these corners of the pyramid have to be there in order to have disease. You need the host plant of the disease, you need the pathogen to be there or the pest, and then you need the conditions to be right for that pest or that pathogen to be able to survive. And it's only in that overlapping place that you can have disease. And so it makes sense that if we can interrupt one of those three things, either the pest isn't present, the conditions aren't right, the host plant isn't present, that we can not have the disease or the pest problem. And so this fits into a broader pyramid. If you've, if you've heard me talk before, you might have heard me tell you that horticulturists love triangles, and it's true, we clearly do. Um, the IPM pyramid, um, you see, has increasing potential for environmental impact as you move up the pyramid. And all of these companion planting strategies would be at the foundational level of the IPM pyramid with cultural practices. This is about making sure that the plants are as happy as possible so that they can resist pest and disease pressures on their own. So you can see why it would be attractive. Yeah, companion plants, let's do that. We're going to be low down on the pyramid with this low, low uh, potential for environmental impact. It's easy to apply this. So we definitely um, say, well, we wanna do this, of course. But it's important to remember that within integrated pest management, we want to suppress populations of a pest or a disease below a determined injury level. And that's a an injury level that you, the grower, will determine is like how much how much flea beetle damage is acceptable to you, for example. And remember that suppress is not equal to control. So even with companion plantings, we're going to talk today about some some claims of pretty miraculous things happening with companion planting. Just remember that in the context of IPM, which is what companion plants really fit into, you're not going to get complete control of anything. You're you're aiming at suppression. All right. So with that brief definition of terms and placement. Now let's get into talking about evaluating those claims of companionship. So step one, I want to learn about the best companion plants. So I type into my search engine, right, best companion plants for me. Um, and I find an online article, it looks great. And a claim is made in the article and the claim you can see there. Garlic repels red spider mites and garlic sprays help control late blight. Well, that's interesting. And what's really great about this article is that, hey, it's got that little number three. They've even got cited references. That's something that not all online articles can claim. 
So I'm, I'm excited. I feel like I found a good resource uh, because it, all right, we've got a citation, but we've got some issues here too. For example, I'm not sure what a red spider mite is, um, but garlic repels it. So maybe it's something like this. I'm not sure. Bring the garlic in, away it goes. We're gonna find this out. Garlic gets rid of this vampire situation, maybe. What do we mean garlic repels them? Um, so let's see, all right. I'm not sure exactly what they mean here. So I'm gonna go to the references. And so uh, article source has been redacted uh, for the protection <laughs> of the innocent and not so innocent alike. But here, all right, great. We've got this awesome list of references. And if I look at these, I can see, all right, we've got a, we've got a scientific article there. Um, we've got universities, we've got extension services. This looks really good. So you might be tempted to say, all right, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna stop here. I'm like, yeah, they've got extension. It says it repels red spider mites. Great, what's, what's more to know? Let's plant the garlic. I don't want spider mites, but I encourage you find that reference and see what it actually says. And again, this, this online source is, is really on the whole, uh, not too bad. Not only do they have references, they've, they've been kind enough to actually link them. So I don't have to do another search to find the reference. I can just click on this link and pull up um, what is actually a several page document about the registration of garlic oil as a uh, pesticide of minimum impact or minimum impact pesticide regulated by the EPA, which is great. And so I've pulled out just two excerpts of that multi-page document that I would like to draw your attention to. The first one is that fresh garlic needs to be processed before it can be applied as a pesticide. Um, so there goes planting my fresh garlic to repel spider mites um, because a pesticide is designed to repel or kill pests. It's not going to work. The reference says, oh yeah, this doesn't say plant garlic to repel red spider mites. It says processed garlic products like garlic oil can work as a pesticide. Whether or not they even work on spider mites remains to be seen. There was also that claim about late blight. And that's the second excerpt. Late blight um, is phytophthora. Um, it's the same stuff that caused the Irish potato famine. And you can see here that again, a, a steam distilled um, water dilution of to a particular concentration of this one active ingredient, um, allicin, is what was able to destroy the fungus. That's awesome. It killed the fungus at the right concentration. That is very, very, uh, very dissimilar to planting garlic next to my tomatoes. Um, and so what looked at first like a supported claim by a scientific institution with a reference turns out to be not. So that's kind of disappointing, but let's look at another one. Let's say, all right, that was a one-off. That's clearly a miss. So, all right, here's another claim from the same article. This is all about tomatoes, by the way. Best companion plants for tomatoes. See, borage improves growth and flavor and repels tomato hornworms. Well, that's interesting. All right, so we've got three claims and all right, but good, we've got another cited reference. Number two, let's look. Pest control companion planting chart. Excellent, Brigham Young University. Great, it's an academic source. I'm gonna click on that link. And this is what comes up, a PDF of a chart taken from newselfsufficientliving.com. And I hope that I do not need to point out, uh, but I will anyway, that Brigham Young University does not equal newselfsufficientliving.com. And what actually happened here was Brigham Young University hosted a, a public seminar where they invited all sorts of people to give talks and presentations and posters. And this was one of the talks at the seminar. So it's, uh, on a hosted, this resource was hosted at a, on a, a BYU server um, because it was an event that happened on BYU campus. But this is not a BYU resource. This is a, an unsighted table from newselfsufficientliving.com. So there's two strikes that a pretty easy click, thankfully these were nicely hyperlinked references, showed what looked like good scientific references were really bogus. All right. Hey, John. Yes. Before you go on, would you mind turning off your camera? Some people are saying that you're, they're seeing you large and your slides small. So we're thinking if you turn your camera off, it might help. All right, I'm off. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> so next, we're going to look and go through some common claim examples. 
So I've organized these according to um, general categories of the types of claims that can be made. Some of these align along logical fallacies that are pretty common. Some of them are, are themes that are really particular to companion planting, in my opinion. Uh, but the first one is this, and I call it the bold and the beautiful, because this is either a really hopeful wish or a just a really bold and pretty obviously um, disprovable statement. So here's a claim. Again, this is a quote. This is from a published companion planting book. You can check it out of the library. You can read it and you can get all this information. The claim is this. Flea beetles don't like moist, dark areas, so keep your plants close. All right, so there's the claim. Let's evaluate it. First thought, let's consider that statement about beetles. Is it true? Flea beetles don't like moist, dark areas. Well, what kind of flea beetles? There are lots of kinds of flea beetles, like dozens of kinds of flea beetles. Does it mean all flea beetles? Um, which flea beetles are we talking about here? Let's assume it's most flea beetles. So they just say flea beetles? All right, it's all flea beetles. So let's look into the life history of flea beetles. And you could do this using uh, your extension office, extension publications, uh, scientific publications, you have, if you have access to those. Um, and you'll find that in the life history of flea beetles, they overwinter the adults in debris and crevices in the garden and that the larvae are soil dwelling. So both of those suggest to me that they at least don't mind the dark um, and probably aren't too opposed to things being moist either. And furthermore, the adults are strong flyers. So even if they don't like moist dark areas, um, they might go to a moist dark area to feed and then fly somewhere else, conceivably. I don't like going to the grocery store, but I do it. But let's consider this. All right, I'm not sure. Maybe they don't like moist dark areas because all I have is some, some circumstantial sort of conclusions. All right, based on the life history, that seems like a weird claim. But even if that's true, let's say that, all right, I'll take you at your word, flea beetles don't like moist dark areas. Does the recommended practice in this case make any sense? So adult, uh, adult flea beetles and even the larvae of some species will feed on the surfaces of leaves. And so you can see in these two pictures here, uh, the top one's the most common flea beetle we'll deal with, at least in a vegetable garden. And that's the, uh, the crucifer flea beetle. You can see it's there on some radishes and they have this leaf surface pitting, gouging, and then they hop away quickly if you try to catch them. But is any density of planting my radishes or cabbages um, possible to eliminate exposed leaf surfaces? Hmm, maybe I should just use a row cover because that way none of these leaves are going to be uh, on the surface, right? All of the leaves will be in a dark, moist place. But wait a minute, a row cover is just working by exclusion, not because it's moist and dark under there. All right, let's look at another one. Dill can greatly reduce the yield of caraway and tomatoes as it is known to attract tomato hornworm. So that should raise questions for you for a couple of reasons. First, um, why would dill attract tomato hornworm? So that would be something to investigate. And second, what bearing does tomato hornworm, a specialist caterpillar on uh, members of the Solanaceae, uh, make to caraway, a member of a completely different plant family? Here's another one. Chives will prevent apples scab, and when planted with roses, they can prevent black spot fungus. Expect it to take at least three years before these diseases can be prevented. So a couple red flags in here. Number one, whenever you see a spelling error, um, apples scab, that should be a red flag that this may be not um, the most reviewed publication that has ever been printed. And then some claims of um, chives being able to prevent a fungus on rose leaves. And then, oh yeah, it's gonna take three years. I mean, after three years, do you even remember why you planted the chives? Perhaps you've given up. This one's one of my favorites. Eggplant are good to plant with corn as the uh, eggplant deter raccoons from eating the corn and the corn protects the eggplant from a virus that causes wilt. So raccoons, as you probably know, are uh, pretty agile and acrobatic omnivorous creatures. Um, they get into chimneys, they can climb fences. So I'm not sure what about an eggplant would deter it from climbing your corn stalks to harvest the corn. The second red flag um, is that uh, eggplant viruses tend to cause leaf modeling, shoe stringing. There is no eggplant virus that causes wilt. That photograph there is an eggplant with a virus. And how exactly the corn is going to prevent um, the animal vector or the human vector even of that virus in the photograph is beyond me. 
So a number of claims in there are like, hey, that sounds good. Raccoons must not like eggplant. If I just plant eggplant by the corn, the raccoon will stay far away. Um, that is a bold and beautiful claim. All right, the next type of uh, companion, champ, uh, companion plant claim that you might hear is one of extreme generality. Um, so for example, foxglove is known to stimulate the growth of tomatoes and potatoes and even apples, and it will protect them from fungus. It is known for giving strength and longer life for all the plants growing close to it. Um, wow, that's a broad and general idea, and I'm not sure exactly what that could possibly mean. Oregano provides general press protection, and dill can repel aphids and spider mites and sometimes squash bugs. So hopefully some of those are raising your eyebrows in terms of, all right, well, what exactly do you mean? And gosh, that's bold and or awfully general. I wish I knew more. A couple of words to draw your attention to again, um, just in terms of how the language works. The first one is even. And that word in there will predispose your mind to think that this is a better, uh, better companion plant than, um, or treatment or medicine or orange juice or whatever, um, than it might actually be. So if it says even apples, and it could say even whatever, then you're thinking, all right, everything in front of that, it works really well on. And if it will even work on what I'm assuming must be a difficult crop to stimulate growth on, if it will even work on apples, how well must it work on all of these things that have been listed before? The second one is sometimes. And uh, this is one of those hard to prove, hard to stick down, uh, you know, 90% of the time, it works 50% of the time sort of statements. There's really no way to tell if what you're doing is making a difference if the, if the claim is literally that sometimes this works. Um, that's, that's just impossible to evaluate. And so um, this claim should immediately be flagged as questionable and worthy of further investigation. All right, next we'll talk about uh, claims that have the element of truth. And so for example, sunflowers have an interesting relationship with ants and aphids. The ants will herd the aphids onto the stalks where they can do little damage because the stalks are so tough. Plant sunflowers wherever aphids are a problem and you will find the problem disappear. Sunflowers also attract many birds, including hummingbirds. All right, so it is true that ants have a mutualistic relationship with aphids because they're harvesting the honeydew out of those aphids, right? The aphid is collecting the same plant from the phloem of the plant. Um, so aphids can effectively feed on stems just as well as they can uh, effectively feed on leaves, as you see here in the picture. Um, and the ants are harvesting the, the aphid waste, aphid excrement, which is loaded with sugar. And so the ants uh, want to eat it. So that is true. Uh, the ants are not hurting, deliberately hurting aphids onto the stalks of sunflowers because they can do little damage. Um, so that is where this becomes a bolder claim um, because if the aphids are producing honeydew, the ants are going to use them and protect them right where they are. There's no reason for those ants to say, well, we're gonna move you over here where you won't do any damage to these other plants. That's uh, that's just a, a crazy idea. And then sunflowers attract many birds, including hummingbirds. Well, number one, that is completely irrelevant to pest control, so that's cute. And number two, um, sunflowers aren't attractive to hummingbirds at all. Um, hummingbirds, as you probably know, are attracted to red flowers with long tubular um, morphology, lots of nectar in the base, which is everything a sunflower is not. Let's look at another one that's got, again, an element of truth. Garlic repels aphids, so plant it near roses, apple trees, pear trees, cucumbers, lettuce, and celery. Garlic is also known to accumulate sulfur, which is a naturally occurring fungicide that helps prevent disease. It's effective against diseases that damage stone fruit, cucumbers, spinach, and nuts. You can plant garlic with your tomatoes to prevent the red spider mites. There they are again. And then garlic is a bad companion for all of these reasons. All right, well, let's look at this. What is an effective what is effective against diseases that damage stone fruit, cucumbers, and spinach? And that pronoun is actually referring to sulfur. Sulfur is effective against fungal diseases. Garlic is not. Another great example of the element of truth, one of the best ways to stop thrips is to grow pyrethrum. That's a type of plant where we get um, an insecticide, pyrethrins. Um, and it's true that many thrips are killed when they feed on this particular plant, not all of them, but that is not going to stop thrips from feeding on your other plants. It's just going to kill them if they feed on that one. 
And similarly, tomatoes will protect asparagus against asparagus beetles because they contain a substance called solanine. Now that is like me saying that I'm going to go and drink a case of beer so that Darren will be drunk. It's just silly. The compound is in a completely different plant than the one that the protective claim is being made on. All right. This one, the Hatfields and McCoys, these plants hate each other. You can see that hyacinths are good companions to most garden plants, except carnations. If you plant carnations, uh, hyacinths where carnations have grown in the past, the hyacinths will die. And the same goes for carnations. They will die if planted where hyacinths have grown. And that's, you know, if you try to Google search for pictures of carnations and hyacinths growing together, there is no picture available. So maybe that's true. Um, but it is a, an odd and bold claim to make that these plants dislike one another so much. Or there's such a strong reaction that any time that if you planted hyacinths there, you'll never grow carnations again. That is a, a claim that bespeaks to the, uh, the sort of deep-seated emotion and grudge holding that only humans are capable of. And here we've got one that's Hatfields and Hatfields, I think. Um, so you'll notice this, this little seed rat card from the beginning of the talk. We're gonna look at cabbage this time instead of carrots. And you'll see that I should plant broccoli, Brussels sprout, celery, chard, cucumber, dill, lettuce, nasturtium, and sage for some reason with my cabbage, but I should avoid planting beets. And you may be, I'm wondering if anybody notices something about this list should be sticking out to you. And it is that chard and beets, hmm, those are both beta vulgaris. That's the same plant. So how could I plant it with it and also avoid it? It doesn't make sense. All right, this one I had to come up with my own name. It's the fire hose, the sleight of hand, and it's correlation and causation. So like any good fire hose, this is applying a lot really quickly to you. Good companion plants for the cherry tree include garlic, onion, tansies, and nasturtium to keep the pests away. The garlic is known to help repel rabbits, aphids, spider mites, apple scabs, borers, peach, leaf disease, Japanese beetles, spider mites, must really work on spider mites because that's the second time they've come up, ants, cabbage looper, and cabbage maggots. Wow, look at how many pests that, that keeps away. We're not really sure why we need to keep cabbage loopers away from our cherry trees, but the garlic is gonna do it. And then potatoes are prone to blight if planted in the vicinity of cherry trees. Um, sort of a weird add-on to my cherry trees. And that's the one where it could be correlation versus causation. It may in fact be possible that potatoes growing near cherry trees are susceptible to blight. I have no idea if that's true or not. But if it is true, um, it could be that um, potatoes growing in places where the temperatures are between, oh, you know, 60 and 80 degrees and it's kind of wet, like springtime um, in the Northwest where we're growing cherries, for example, those conditions are really favorable for Phytophthora development. So it might just be that places that cherries do well, potatoes don't do well, and it has nothing to do with the fact that the two plants are growing together. And yet more. So this time we need to protect our pumpkin patch. You can see that buckwheat, catnip, tansy, and radishes all help pumpkins. That's wonderful. Why do they help pumpkins? Because they attract spiders and ground beetles, keeping those insects away from the pumpkin. Number one, spiders aren't insects. Number two, why on earth would you want to keep spiders away from your pumpkins? Radishes will keep flea beetles away and nasturtiums will deter beetles and various bugs. There's a generality again, various bugs, okie dokie. So radishes will keep flea beetles away from your pumpkins. Let's just zero in on that particular claim. Well, this going back to our initial flea beetle claim begs the question, well, which flea beetles? Do you mean the crucifer flea beetle that goes after radishes? because that's very different than the pumpkin beetle or the pumpkin flea beetle, which does not even occur in the United States of America. And here is, of course, our poor confused and hurt spider, because why on earth would we want to keep a spider or a ground beetle, both of which are predators of other insects, away from our pumpkin patch? Those we want in the pumpkin patch because they might be hunting other insects. So next we're gonna look at a couple of examples of scientific studies that have shown um, some companion planting um, non-benefits. So yarrow and feverfew interplanted with squash was hoping to see a pest reduction. And there was no effect on squash bugs by planting the yarrow or the feverfew, still had tons of squash bugs and they reduced the squash yield. So that is one where, hey, this didn't work. We thought we were gonna attract beneficial insects. 
Now, one way that um, this study could have been different or maybe could be repeated um, with somebody else is, well, let's try some different plants. Because if we think back to IPM and that disease triangle, you know, we've got squash bugs, we've got the host of the squash bugs, we want to attract something to eliminate the squash bugs. And as you see in the picture, those things are pretty big. And if I'm planting yarrow um, or feverfew, those are, are um, plants that are demonstrated to attract beneficials, yes, but they're beneficials like lacewings and surfid flies and minute pirate bugs. These are small insects that would, you know, great at taking out things like aphids or mites. They're not great at taking out these in comparison, gigantic squash bugs. So that might be one where the idea is in the right place, we're just using the wrong plants. So again, no effect whatsoever. Uh, similarly, planting a meadow mix um, near hops did not affect the numbers of spider mites or aphids, but it did reduce the yield. So there was something there where we were thinking, all right, if I can increase the habitat complexity, which is supported by research, um, I'll get more beneficial insects. But just having that mix of meadow plants there didn't make a difference on the spider mites. And then this one is perhaps my favorite. Um, geraniums are known to repel cabbage worms, wonderful. And Japanese beetles will deter beet uh, and will deter beet leafhopper. So geraniums deter Japanese beetles. Yeah, right. Um, I think you probably know, yes, Japanese beetles love geraniums. And yes, um, sometimes the Japanese beetles can be killed. But this study um, pretty clearly, and this is not a brand new study, it's from 2003. Uh, pretty clearly, and it's not alone, indicated that um, interplanting with geraniums significantly increased numbers of Japanese beetles on roses. So now that we're all convinced that this is all just a load of wishful thinking, um, let's look at some things that show that, hey, maybe this is something. So no reason, no need for depression. Hang in there. We're going to end on a high note. So we're going to look at some evidence for companion planting success now with pest suppression and plant vigor uh, environmental improvement and flavor enhancement. So first, pest suppression. So this can work in a number of ways. Um, one and the most likely and the most supported by research is conservation biocontrol. That is, if you have a, a vegetationally diverse planting, you're going to attract and support a more diverse group of invertebrates that includes naturally occurring predators of pest insects. The second is direct repellency, and that's where whatever plant that you are planting as the companion plant has some kind of effect that actually drives pest insects away. And then the third one is crop camouflage, and this is where either because of the diversity or because of the phenolic compounds or volatile compounds that the companion plants are releasing, um, the pest insects just can't find the desired crop. So the first one we're going to look at is tomatoes, marigolds, and whitefly. You know, marigolds are one of those plants that are, um, they have been shown to work as a companion plant, and they are also trotted out as a, as a miracle cure. And so it's, it's not the complete extreme, but hey, they do have some benefits. And I'm going to show you two studies here. The first one um, showed that marigolds reduced whitefly populations in greenhouse tomatoes. And that's wonderful. Planting marigolds with the tomatoes also reduced tomato yields. And so that study um, showed actually that it was better to hang sachets releasing limonene, which was the plant compound that the marigolds were producing, that was more effective and didn't reduce the tomato yields. So in, in a greenhouse situation, that makes sense. Um, you might want to put your marigolds out with your tomatoes since you um, probably have less, uh, less easy ability to get limonene to hang out there. One thing I do want to point out too um, is that with companion planting claims, it's important to use botanic names. I mean, really with everything. And why is that? Because you can see here are two plants that both go by the name marigold. And the study looked at the bottom one, genus Tagetes, did not look at the top one, genus Calendula. Um, so if you plant calendulas or marigolds under your tomatoes and they're that kind, you're not going to get any effect. If you plant marigolds, it's going to work. And in this case, they even specified that it was uh, French marigolds. Um, that is to say, uh, now I'm not gonna be able to come up with the botanic name, Tagidi is not erecto, that's African. But you need to know um, the botanic name of the plant that was studied so that you can see if that study is even applicable to your situation. Uh, this was also shown actually quite a while ago in the, in the 80s um, that both lemongrass that was cut and marigolds 
uh, released volatiles that repelled female thrips in cowpea fields in Africa. So there is evidence to suggest that marigolds, if you get the right kind, can have some beneficial effects, but it's not all beneficial. Again, the marigolds did reduce tomato yields, even while they reduced white fly populations. And also remember from IPM, reduce does not equal eliminate. There's also two studies that found that diverse plantings can and do make it more difficult for pest insects to find their hosts. And this was actually shown to be just the diversity and the number of green leaves that were not host leaves made a huge difference. Um, it didn't matter how smelly as it were those leaves were. And in fact, um, the study uh, by George and others in 2013 showed that you could even do this with fake plants. And so they put their crop out there and then surrounded the crop with plastic plants. Um, and the plastic plants worked just as well as intercropping with real plants to hide that host plant from uh, certain pests. But there is evidence to suggest that chemicals can work too. So this study um, just done two, uh, three years ago in 2019 showed that garlic and garlic chives growing around strawberries um, would repel a particular plant bug that goes after the strawberry fruits. Um, and that was not just because of the density of planting, which was tested, but must be something about the compounds that the garlic chives in particular were releasing because they did a study where they had the strawberries growing in space above the garlic chives. So not where the garlic chives could be seen at all. And somehow still that um, the working assumption is that the uh, volatile compounds from the garlic chives were able to disguise the signature, the olfactory signature, if you will, of the strawberries to make them harder to see. So definitely evidence for camouflaging. All right, now let's look at some direct plant partnerships. First one, borage and strawberries. So this study just two years ago showed that planting borage near strawberries increased the yields of those fruits. And that is suspected because of a pollination boost. Does it need to be borage? Well, we're not sure because other studies found that pollinator friendly plantings around strawberries made no difference. But then the thought is, well, maybe it's actually bumblebees because bumblebees are really good at pollinating strawberries. And they also are specialist pollinators of, of borage because they use what is called buzz pollination, where they vibrate their wing muscles to get the pollen out. As you could see, uh, that's not a borage in the photograph, but the bumblebee just buzz pollinated that syrinthi. And so it might not be that any pollinator friendly planting works, but pollinator planting specific to improving habitat for bumblebees helped with those strawberry yields. All right, this is one of the neatest plant companionships in my opinion. And this is a study that showed that um, millet, when grown with rice, helped the rice with drought stress, as long as they weren't too crowded together. And this was based on the concept of hydraulic lift, which is something that has been shown um, in, e in plant ecology situations, especially uh, out in deserts with shrubs that are rooted very deeply with perennials. And the idea being, um, as you can see in the diagram here, that during the dry season at night, water is brought from the very deep levels of the soil up to the surface of the soil simply by the physical properties of water from moving to a wet to a dry area by capillary action, making that water more available to shallow rooted species. And so the millet was able to root more deeply and bring up this deep water to the aid of the rice. Now, as soon as the plants became too crowded, just the competition there still had too many effects and yield were still reduced. But as long as the plants weren't too crowded, having the millet with the rice improved its resistance to drought. All right, let's look at another way that you can be successful with companion planting, and that is with environmental modification. The most popular example of this is with nurse plants. And so this would be where planting two species together in the same plot or the same hole increases restoration site survival of those plants. Um, for example, in Hawaii with native plants, they've got success by planting a slow growing native shrub in the same hole with a native perennial that's able to grow more quickly. This is for two reasons, it mimics natural succession. Um, it can provide hosts for hemiparasitic plants. This was especially the case in Hawaii, it can hold container substrate together. And then famously in deserts, <clears throat> as it's pictured here, those nurse plants can provide shade and protection and increased humidity for small plants. And so saguaro cacti, for example, 
are famous for being able to germinate and grow better when they are in the, uh, the nurturing embrace of a nurse shrub. Excuse me. All right, next example of environmental modification, is soil compaction and tap roots. And so there was a study in 2014 that did show that tap rooted species used as cover crops were able to increase water and air circulation in fine textured soils. The two crops studied in particular were rapeseed or canola, it's pictured here, and also forage radish. They were not able to undo compaction completely in that field. Um, this field was also growing wheat. And um, depending on the soil texture, it did or didn't work. So in, in textured uh, soils with more sand um, that were a bit uh, larger particle size, there was no difference of those cover crops. But in a fine textured soil, it actually made a difference with airflow and water flow to have those tap-rooted species in there. This is again in an agricultural setting, so it might be of limited application in a garden setting. And it's important to note also that it didn't completely undo the compaction. It helped some, but it wasn't a cure-all. All right, next and last, let's talk about companion planting for flavor enhancement. And there is actually no evidence published whatsoever about flavor enhancement for companion planting. Um, this may be because flavor is a pretty subjective uh, measure, but there's just <clears throat> no published research about this that I was able to find whatsoever. So take any claim of flavor enhancement, I think with a grain of salt, and if it tastes good to you, then let's say, hey, it worked. <clears throat> uh, so just to conclude before we uh, take some questions, so what do we think about plant companionship? What have we learned? So I hope your takeaways today are that plants don't grow in a vacuum. They've got relationships with one another and they are certainly relating with one another and they are certainly relating with their environment. How exactly those relationships are happening, that is what we don't know, or at least not very well. And so even in a photograph like you can see here, there are maybe six plant species growing in that photograph. There's a lot of complex relationships happening there. So even there to try to study and tease out what are the relationships among these plants is really difficult, which leads me to the next point. So one of my ecology professors uh, back in undergrad was fond of saying, and I am also fond of saying, ecology is not rocket science, it's harder. And companion plants really at the core are all about ecology. And it's not cut and dried, it's not easy. So if you see a bold claim made or a very simple, oh, you know, garlic will cure cancer. That's fine, and maybe there is some evidence to support that in certain situations, certain benefits can be gained, but those blanket statements are almost always an oversimplification or a generalization or one of those other um, type of claims that we talked about today. So make sure you evaluate those claims carefully using trusted resources. And the trusted resources I again recommend to you are uh, your extension office, um, and uh, published resources, which you can access, usually through public libraries have access to those databases. If you wanna be able to search published scientific literature yourself, um, knock yourself out. Um, and then again, approach your extension office, talk to the master gardener volunteers, talk to your horticulture agent and say, I've heard that this claim has been made. Can I find some evidence to support or to refute that claim? And then lastly, I mean, we're gardening here. So ultimately I would say um, another person uh, that you probably all know, uh, Dr. Koski at CSU likes to say, if it helps you sleep at night, go for it. And I will just reiterate that. You know what, if you wanna plant marigolds because it helps you sleep at night thinking they're helping your tomatoes, you go for it. And then lastly, remember though, that open minds are open for the same reason as open mouths. And that is to be closed upon something, hopefully something that will be nourishing. So remember when you're gardening, you've gotta make a decision. And so you have to decide, well, is the potential yield reduction worth the potential pest control? And that's where um, knowing your situation is going to be the most helpful, knowing your goal, what's your IPM goal, what's your IPM threshold, what's your IPM strategy. Um, but just saying like, oh, well, I'm gonna have an open mind about companion plants, so that's great. But you do have to make a decision at some point about whether or not you're going to include them in your garden. But remember, it's gardening. So this is going to be fun. Hopefully this is not a, a make or break situation for anybody. Um, so try some stuff, take some notes, see what you find. And at this point, we can take questions. Great, thank you so much, John. And you can turn your, yes, camera back on. 
excellent presentation. I learned things. I always do when I sit in on your presentations. Um, so if anybody has questions, feel free to go to that Q&A and we can start looking through those. Um, we do have a question, not so much about companion planting, but somebody's asking about aphids. Aphids have attacked their currants for the past several years, particularly new leaves. Any suggestions on what to do? So um, one thing comes to mind, if it's early spring, oftentimes those aphid infestations will get going on the early leaves because the aphids are just ahead of the um, bile controls, like lady beetles, for example. They're just ahead of them. So if you give it time, oftentimes the lady beetles will catch up and get rid of the aphids. And then I want to look because I think that the current aphid, I think it's current lettuce aphid, and I think it's moving to a new host in spring. So that's the sort of thing that will resolve itself when those aphids move to their summer host. If you wanted to take a control measure um, over the winter, uh, dormant oil applied to your current shrub could help because if there are aphid eggs laid at the bud tips, and again, this is where I'd want to go verify that I've got the aphid life cycle of that aphid correct, but assuming that it's laying eggs at the bud tips of the current, dormant oil could help by smothering those eggs and, and breaking that population string. Um, Amy or Darren, thought, other thoughts about current aphids? No, I think that's that's great. Great information. Thank you. So we're just waiting for more questions to come in. All right, good. Um, Hopefully everyone's now just feels empowered to go answer their own questions using yeah. critical thinking yeah. and research. <laughs> I think that was an excellent part of your presentation. It wasn't just this plant works, this plant doesn't, whatever, but sort of an education on how to do the research, which is fantastic. Let's see. Um, we have a thank you coming in. Great presentation. Oh, Maybe. thank you, Amy. Tagidi's patula for French marigolds. Tagidi's <laughs> erecta is the African one. All right, so Tom asked, um, many claims are probably not believable, but what happens to the beginning gardener who's looking for information with what appears to be university-based research and how does someone discern that that research is actually science-based? Right, so a couple of ways to do that. And that's a great question. And you're right, there is so much out there and so much of it seems authoritative. And so I would go through those steps that, that I covered um, specifically, if it's got a reference, if it says, oh, this is the study or this is the reference that I'm basing this claim off of, go to the very bottom of it. Don't take it at the author's word or on faith that, hey, they've got a cited reference. So the cited reference must be appropriate do the work. And again, the, the example that I used was an easy one because they were kind enough to link their references. It might mean getting the title of the reference, doing another search um, and spending some time searching around on the internet to find the actual source of information they're claiming supports the, the companion plant claim so that you can read it for yourself and evaluate it. Um, secondly, make sure that just if it says, oh, it's Cornell University or BYU, for example, that example, uh, same example of that article that was online, you need to verify that the source is actually a university source and not just hosted on the website. And that's going to be, if it's an extension source, there will be the extension uh, disclaimer on it or the extension information at the bottom of the sheet that says like, hey, this is what it is. You can look at the website and make sure that it says .edu at the end of it. And then lastly is the fail safe. If you're really lost, again, I would just encourage you to call your local county extension office and ask, say, hey, this is something I'm trying to figure out. And we are here as extension to help answer questions. That's our whole job. And so we would love for you to call with those sorts of questions so that we'd be able to help um, both figure out the strategies to get to the answer and also to find the answer. All right. Uh, we have a large deer population, keep them out of the flowers, um, planting mint and onions on the borders of the beds. Um, so part of the hiding from deer thing could be just numbers of leaves. The best way to prevent deer is exclusion. So if you can put up a fence, put up a fence. Um, but deer are a difficult pests to, to, to try to control. And so growing a diverse, um, a diverse garden and trying to hide, if you will, the, the choice things could be a good option for you. It might mean a hedge. Um, again, if it's a nice tall hedge, especially, they won't even try to jump it. Um, those all could be strategies that would work to try to figure out, all right, let's keep the deer from eating this. 
I'm not aware of any, and I was reviewing the Deer fact sheet you know, two years ago, so um, there might be something new. I'm not aware of any proven like companion plant or deer repellent plants because a deer will sample just about anything, as you probably know if you're dealing with them. Um, so again, I tried plant diversity and offense. And I'm just going to add one thing. We had a couple of other wildlife questions. Raccoons, bunnies, deer exclusion is your safest bet. It's good, you know, it's fine to experiment with different plants and see what they like or don't like, but exclusion is really, fencing them out is really going to be the best bet. Yeah, excellent point. Thank you. Um, let's see. I am going to, all right. Have you heard anything uh, promising that daffodils actually do deter gophers? I've heard that uh, gophers will eat daffodils first, leaving the veggies beyond them in the center of the garden alone. Um, I have not heard that. That seems at least plausible, but I would want to do a, um, I would want to look through the literature to see what I could find about that. Because it's also true that um, narcissus or daffodils are among the more poisonous bulbs. Whether or not gophers are affected or not, um, I don't know, but that'd be one to, seems potentially plausible. All right, um, but I'd wanna look to verify it. All right, uh, similar to a question, how do we access scientific papers through extension? Uh, frustrated with a Google search and blog post that explain why cucumbers and squash plants uh, have white brittle edges. Okay, so, um, couple ways. On Google, you try using Google Scholar and you will be able to access public domain scientifically published papers. Um, if you call the extension office or go to the extension office, um, depending on who is at the extension office that day, you may be able to access those papers there or have that person search the database for you. And then the third way to get to those papers would be to go to your public library which have access to those, you know, to get access to those um, journals, you have to have a subscription. Um, but usually public libraries do to have to one or more databases for scientific journals. So going to the public library um, and hopping on one of their computers can be a way to get that access. Um, it can be helpful. You can start at home, for example, on Google Scholar to look for the published papers if they exist, because that's the other question is like, not a lot of studies particularly are looking at daffodils repelling gophers, for example, that would be um, you might find a couple papers, but if you're able to find authors or paper titles online at home, but you just can't access the full text, you can go with those titles to the library then to get the full text. Um, all right, Matthew asks, can, oh, Darren's typing, great. Squirrels are eating your bulbs. Um, would this also be the case of needing to create a barrier? Um, is there anything that I can plant over the bulbs to discourage the squirrels? Yeah, a barrier is number one gonna be the best option. Um, there are a number of products that can be um, repellent to squirrels, but again, it's not squirrel proof. Um, so that's where, um, yeah, if you, if you can just exclude the squirrels, that is the way to go. All right, I think that was it. And we're just three minutes out. Perfect.